Good morning. Good morning. I have brought something that some of you might know. And as some of you know, I lived in South Africa for many years and I attended church. And I learned with others how to make these crosses. And I am a hoarder on top of everything else. So I have carried this all my life. And because I'm doing the reading today and it happens to be Palm Sunday, I thought I would bring it just as a reminder. I mean, who can forget? So the reading is Matthew 26, from 69 to 75. Peter disowns Jesus. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. <laughs> Don't talk about my accent. <laughs> then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Yeah, ends the reading. Let's just welcome Penny to come up and share the word with us. Father, just thank you for your word. Thank you that it is just so liberating. Jesus, you say you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And we just pray, Lord, as we take in the word, Lord, thank you that Penny spent so much time meditating on this and receiving from your spirit. And we receive from Penny, we receive from your spirit. Just pray you'd liberate us, Lord, into the fullness of life that you long to give us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Penny. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's wonderful to be back. We missed you. And I just want to begin by thanking you all so much for your prayers for Rod and I because, as you know, we had a bit of a, a rough ride on part of our holiday. Um, but it was wonderful knowing that the church was standing with us in prayer and the Lord did come through for us, didn't he, Rod? So thank you. Uh, <clears throat> just before, the, the, the topic today, by the way, is you can't deny it. That's what I was asked to speak about. Um, from this passage in Matthew 26. Um, <clears throat> just a little way, a little time before I began to really get stuck into thinking about it and praying about it, I happened to watch um, a, a, a drama series on iPlayer um, based on Agatha Christie's novel, And Then They Were None. Everyone's heard of Agatha Christie? Yes. The greatest crime novelist, some people say, <laughs> in the whole world. Well, she wrote many books, and apparently this was the one that is the most popular. How many of you know the story of And There Is None? Does any, a few of you do. But basically, uh, it was dramatized with a wonderful cast by the BBC in about 2015. But th there were a bunch of people, about 10 of them, I think, who went, who were all call called in different ways onto an island. And then they gradually began to be, they were all accused of murder. And then they began to be sort of bumped off one by one and nobody knew who was the one in their midst that was doing it. And it was an absolute horror, horror film, which I don't usually watch, but I was riveted by it. And the thing that struck me the most about the whole thing was the fact that when they heard this creepy voice coming on over the loudspeaker telling them all that they were murderers, 
They all had absolute excuses for why they were not murderers. But as the plot carried on and the people got closer and closer to possibly being the next victim, you saw all the self-deception begin to fall away and you began to discover what they actually had done and they were all guilty of murder. And it just blew my mind because I thought, that's just what happened with Peter. He was under such self-deception. And, it, you know, it's easy to condemn him for denying Jesus. It's easy for, for us to think, well, you know, we wouldn't have done that. But I think that this is another th little thing that is going on with this, um, this wonderful word we heard about the tsunami this morning. You know, immediately what came into my mind as Martin was speaking that was how as that water recedes, what's lying underneath really comes to view. And isn't that what God does with us sometimes? How he allows what's really with, deep within us that we don't even admit to ourselves to start popping up. So that ultimately in his love and in his mercy, he can deal with it. But we have to recognize it first. And this story of Peter, you know, we may never have stood in a situation like that and said, I never knew Jesus. But how often have we been temp tempted to just keep quiet or not stand up when we could, when we had an opportunity? So we, we shouldn't condemn Peter, and I'm sure none of us do. <clears throat> but I'd like to look in a bit more detail um, at this passage and, in fact, the whole chapter of Matthew 26 because... Um, we have to look not only at his, what happened when Peter denied Jesus to learn some amazing things from it, really, but also we, what led up to it. Now, we've been reminded several times already today that today is Palm Sunday. Yay! Well, Peter and all the disciples, can you imagine what it was like for them on Palm Sunday? Oh, I think they would have absolutely loved it. There they come up to Jerusalem. Okay, they were a bit nervous because they knew Jesus wasn't the most popular. But there he's arranged this whole thing, this triumphal entry. And there's Peter, the leader of the 12. I mean, he might have been the one leading the donkey. You know, we don't know. But he was, he was there at the forefront with other, the other 12 disciples, other 11, sorry, um, just basking in the glory of everybody recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah. You know what they were shouting, don't you? Hosanna! Yeah. What does that mean? Praise the Lord. Yeah. And then what were they shouting? The the Baruch haba Bashem Adonai. That's what it is in Hebrew, and that is a messianic uh, acclamation. It actually meant to those people, when they started shouting, Baruch haba, Bashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they were actually saying, here is the Messiah. Yay! Our time of being under the oppression of the Romans is over. We've got a new era dawning. This is fantastic. And there were the disciples. Wow. And remember, Peter was the first one to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah. The very first one. And he must have, he must have thought, wow, everybody can see it now. There must have been a little bit of pride in there, don't you think? I'm the leader of this band under Jesus, he, I'm his chief disciple. But then what happened? This glorious day, and then they went back to Bethany to their friend's house. And what did Jesus do the very next day? Um, <coughs> there's a, in Matthew, in the way Matthew tells the story, the triumphal entry is on Matthew 21, and then we've got four more chapters of things that happened during Holy Week. And the very first one was Jesus going into the temple. And we know what that was all about, wielding the whip. 
upsetting the scribes and Pharisees. And he didn't just upset the religious hierarchy then. He went on in, the, in all the teaching that Matthew then gives in the next chapters. He describes how Jesus was, was doing everything, it seems, to upset the re religious hierarchy. He was preaching against them with parables. He was openly calling woes down on their heads. And they, they were dangerous people. So the disciples must have been, what's he doing? You know, he, this is so dangerous. So there was, you know, a lot of turmoil going on, I believe, in their minds. Because remember, this is pre-resurrection, pre-everything that we know, pre-Pentecost. They were just people who had the normal Jewish view of of what the Messiah was going to do, even though Jesus had tried to teach them. How do, you, how do you believe in a resurrection if you've never known it happen? You can't, can you? I mean, it didn't make sense to them. So there was all this going on, and then he was also, he predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and wept over Jerusalem, and, and then he kept on telling them he was about to die. And so I think there was a lot of turmoil going on in Peter's heart. Let's look at Matthew 20, chapter 26, in just a little bit more detail. We're not going to go through the whole chapter verse by verse, you'll be glad to know, especially as I am keeping an eye on the time. Um, but Jesus began, he said, okay, it's now the Passover, there's two days left, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be betrayed and given up. He talked about being anointed for burial and then in the last, at the Last Supper, he, which was all about the Passover, remember, and redemption, he, he talked about his body being broken and his blood being shed and them being part of the um, Passover. And then he went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it says he sang a hymn. This is just a little aside, but do you know what that hymn was likely to have been? At the end of Passover, it was traditional for the Jews to sing three psalms. Psalm 116, Psalm 117, and Psalm 118. Go and read those psalms and see how much comfort Jesus must have gained from them. Singing and standing on those words as he went out to face uh, what he knew was coming. Um, of course, Judas had already betrayed him by then. But let's look in more detail briefly before we come to the verses that we've already read at Jesus speaking to Peter about his denial in verse 30, uh, 31. <clears throat> Jesus said to them in verse 31, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Isn't that interesting, by the way? Jesus, quoting scripture, he knew what was happening because he knew the word of God. And I'm going to come back to that before I finish. Very, very important. And I'm so grateful for the, the person who prayed about the word in our worship time because it's key um, to what I want to say today. Um, but after I'm raised up, he's talking about being raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And then look at what Peter says. Peter answered him, though they, who's they? All the other disciples that were there, all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. But dangerous to say something like that, really. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. So he took that stand. Boom. He said, no. And the others all said the same. They followed his lead. Remember, he was the leader. And he must have felt some responsibility. Okay, then we get Gethsemane. And just one scripture here. We, we all know how Jesus went away. He, he left his disciples, took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee 
was really began to be very upset and said to them, verse 38, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So that was the heart of Jesus. But Peter, James, and John, what happened to them? He came back to them and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Matthew says, not to the, so much to the other, so couldn't you stay awake and watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And of course we know that that carried on um, further. And it happened again. And then his betrayer came. And <clears throat> you all remember the story of how Judas betrayed him with a kiss. And then Jesus had actually, Luke tells us, told them to take some swords with them when they went uh, that night. And so somebody took out a sword and cut off the ear of the high priest, uh, high priest servant. It wasn't even one of the soldiers, by the way, that he attacked. It was uh, one of the, the servants. But John tells us, actually, that that was Peter. Doesn't say it in Matthew. But he, you know, oh, I'm the lead. I've got to do something to defend Jesus. Ooh. And Jesus rebuked him because he hadn't understood what it was all about. But then Jesus is taken away, and it says in verse um, 56, Jesus says, all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. So Jesus again was pointing them to the word. But then all the disciples left him and fled. So what he'd foretold happened. But... Verse 58, Peter was following him at a distance. So he, he was watching to see where they took him. And they would have led him up from the Garden of Gethsemane, the bottom of the Kidron Valley, and up a steep hill to the house of the high priest. And if you ever go to Israel, try and visit the church of St. Peter in Galicantu, which means St. Peter of the Cockcrow, which is where the traditional site is for the Caiaphas's house. And there's a path you can go up with steps that date back to the time of Jesus. And uh, walking up that path is, is almost like walking in the footsteps of Jesus. It's an amazing experience. But they took him up there, and there was Peter. And this is where we come to the scripture that we read about. And so his... Peter's reaction was, when he was told about it, was all full of bravado and pride. But here we see what was really, what he was really like. He thought he was brave, but when it came to it, he was filled with fear. He thought he was strong, but in fact he was weak. And that this experience that he had in the courtyard of the high priest's house was like that wave just receding or that pebble falling so far down that he had to see what he was really like. It was self-revelation that came. And, and there were three stages in this. The first one, verse 69, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard so he could see through the door I think what was going on, but he he wasn't he was just with the crowd and the the guards, and a servant girl came up to him and said, "You also were with Jesus the Galilean." So somebody recognised him, and it was a girl. I mean, it wasn't even a, a you know a man that he could be scared of, but it was a girl, and he um, he denied understanding her. He basically said, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? No, no. You know, he, he didn't 
it, it was a fairly weak denial um, compared to what he did later. The second time, <coughs> but after that, he, he withdrew. Um, where are we? Uh, he went out to the entrance. So he perhaps thought, I'm not quite safe here in the glare of the fire. People can see me too much. He distanced himself. And of course, as he moved to the gate, he was moving further away from Jesus. Every time we compromise, every time we, dis we deny or we, we move a little further away, don't we? And that's what happened with Jesus. So he went to the gate where, where he knew he could make a quick getaway if he needed to, right? He was giving himself a way out. And the next time they did it, they, he didn't even, he wasn't even challenged to his face, but he heard them talking. This man was also with them. And he, he this time when he denied it, he said, I, I do not know the man, and he swore. He, he said it with an oath. So he was putting that lie more firmly down with an oath. And then, then he finally, um, after a little while, they came and confronted him directly again, and they said, look, your accent shows you're a Galilean. You've got to be one of them. And this time, he invoked a curse on himself. And he swore again, I don't know this man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. And suddenly, he realized what had, what had happened. And you know that moment of self-revelation was the beginning of Peter's redemption even though it didn't begin quite then and we can see what happened afterwards but that was the time when when he saw himself and you know I think this is the lesson we take away from this personally that we and I was just thrilled when Jamie started the service with Psalm 51 especially in that version which I've never seen before but, you know, we need, don't we, all the time to say, God, show me what's in my heart. Show me what's in my heart. Because a lot of the time we fool ourselves. It's only the Holy Spirit who can really show us what's there so that we can begin to deal with it. And we know what Peter's reaction was. Of course, Luke has that wonderful, wonderful little uh, added extra when he says that Jesus turned and looked at him. He met the eyes of Jesus somehow when that rooster crowed. And Jesus, I believe, was saying, I love you. I warned you about this, but I love you. I still love you. And I think he went out and wept bitterly. But the, the good thing was that that's not the end of the story. He, he had had a catastrophic failure. The leader, the one who should have been encouraging all the others, had failed the, in the most, the greatest way. But he was completely restored. And I want to just read one other verse, which is in Luke. Um, Mark 16, 7 says something interesting after the resurrection when, um, when the women see the angel he says, go tell his disciples and Peter. He's mentioned by name. Make sure Peter gets this message to go, before, to, go to Galilee to meet with Jesus. But then in Luke, and would you believe, oh, there we are. Luke, when, he, when Jesus foretells Peter's denial in Luke, there's, there's a new dimension. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demands to have you that he might sift you like wheat. This is uh, Luke 22, 31. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. 
So according to Luke, Jesus warned him that this was a work of the enemy to try and destroy him because he was going to be so important. Now he should have listened to Jesus and watched and prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and perhaps he wouldn't have had that kind of failure. And yet if he hadn't had that kind of failure, would he have turned out to be the man he was? I don't know. <laughs> Because sometimes the, the, we learn the greatest things from our greatest falls. And, and that's when it becomes really deep, deep and personal. So we know that, that, of course, the wonderful scriptures in John, um, when Peter was at the tomb, I think that's really important as well, that Peter was told that... Um, he was, he was still with the disciples because you'd almost expect that after that kind of failure, he might have just wanted to be, not have anything to do with, with them again because he would have been filled with so much shame and so much guilt. But he stuck with, with the others. And he was, one of, he was actually the first disciple to go into the empty tomb. Even though he and John were there first, John held back and Peter went in. He was the first to see those grave clothes, the first to actually witness that Jesus was risen again, even though he didn't meet him personally first. And of course, we all know the wonderful, wonderful passage in John 21. That was in John 20 where we see about Jesus at the tomb, and um, Peter at the tomb. But in John 21, when Jesus meets him on the Sea of Galilee, where he first called him and restores him with that question three times, do you love me? So we see the incredible love of Jesus in his dealings with Peter. But we also see how Peter learnt from these things because it's absolutely amazing. When we look at Acts, we see him completely transformed, of course, by Pentecost. But we've got the resurrection and Pentecost, haven't we? But he was a powerful preacher, a fearless leader, and the one who first opened the gospel to the Gentiles. Remember Cornelius. He became the leader that God always wanted him to be, that Jesus had trained him to be. He truly did strengthen his brethren. And according to church tradition, he died also by crucifixion, just like Jesus, but he insisted on being crucified upside down so that he would, be, he would not be confused, as it were, with Jesus. And if you read his letter to 1 Peter, uh, in, in his first letter uh, of Peter, you see that he really learned these lessons. There's a, a great scripture in, three, in 1 Peter 3.8. I don't think I marked it. Maybe I did. Uh, yes, I did. Um, where he says, Finally, all of you, this is speaking to believers, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. I think he learned. Yeah. And... Of course, we know about his verses about suffering all through that letter. Um, so he, he wasn't afraid in the end to suffer. And he learned his lesson well. So what about us? Well, will we be tempted to deny Jesus in that way? And we've had plenty... We, we've already heard, and I'm sure we can identify personally with Peter, but when we look... I just want to say something about, very briefly, because I know whew, my time's gone, um, the days in which we live. Because I really do believe that things are going to get harder for Christians. They're going to get harder for us individually and corporately in our nation and in the world. Of course, they're already very, very difficult for many people around the world. We are living in a post-Christian era. We are never going to get back to what it was. We can forget about living in a Christian society. We don't, and we won't. 
we have got to get used to living under occupation. We're under a, an alien rule, culturally. And um, I want to finish uh, by reading you something that I read also uh, fairly recently that really spoke to me. We're not going to change our society back to what it was. Doesn't mean to say we can't have an effect. Doesn't mean to say we can't um, live the kingdom in the midst of the world because that's what we're called to do. But we're not, we can't rely on our culture being sympathetic to us anymore. Uh, we've got our biblical values are actively rejected. We, we know all this, don't we? There's the gender wars, there's the it, radical Islamism is getting stronger and stronger in our nation. Uh, and just talk to our Nigerians to find out what life is like when you've got radical Islamists around. Um, we need to be preparing ourselves for what's to come and the church. And I read this article called Living Under Occupation. Um, I'm not going to read it all to you, but I just want to quote a couple of things. It, I've <coughs> I read it in uh, the online Prophecy Today magazine, which I do recommend. Uh, if anyone wants to know about that, I can pass it on if you don't know it. A uh, weekly email. Um, but this was an article called Living Under Occupation by the Reverend Campbell Jack, who was a, m a retired Church of Scotland minister, but he's left the Church of Scotland now. He's in the Free Church of Scotland. But he says... Um, Despite some ongoing skirmishes, the culture war has been fought and lost. Sorry, go away from the mic. No matter how hard we fight or vociferously comment from the sidelines, there is no going back. Thinking we can halt the juggernaut is delusional. Today is in, it is increasingly difficult for Christians. Tomorrow there will be no Christian safe spaces, not in society, not in the churches. Our main task today is not to try to halt the tide of progressivism, but to focus on building the people, networks, and practices we are going to need tomorrow. And I think that is key. Now's the time we build ourselves and each other and the church up in a way that we will be able to stand when the onslaught comes. It doesn't mean abandoning the world entirely. But we cannot afford to waste time and creative energy attempting to prop up an inevitably failing social order, etc. And then he says, if we are to be of any use in the world, we must begin by spending more time apart from the world in prayer and spiritual training. And so this is really a plea for all of us to spend more time praying, corporately and individually, to spend more time in the word, in the word, in the word, in the word. I know my husband has had a tremendous burden. We've enjoyed that into the word course that we've had the privilege with Martin Charlesworth of being part of this year. And it's grieved Rod every single month to see that there's just a tiny handful compared to the ones we see here on a Sunday that come to that once a month, one Saturday. It's hard work, but boy, is it worthwhile. And I know we're going to run it again. And I beg you, if you, have, if you at all you can, do that course. It's fantastic. We need that. And as a church, we need to be in fellowship with one another. We must not forsake our fellowship because that's going to be our only thing. That's what kept Peter going, I believe, between his denial and the resurrection and the day of Pentecost was his community. He couldn't forsake them, and they couldn't forsake him. We've got to stand together, and we will, and praise God for this church. Can I just close in, with a word of prayer? Yes. Father, we thank you for Peter. We thank you for this man, Lord, who fell so catastrophically, but who rose with such an avalanche of uh, boldness, of power, of obedience, of love, 
of humility after his fall. We thank you, Father, for all that you have done for us. Lord, for the many times you've helped us, for the wonderful ways in which you've blessed us. And even for all that you've done for us this morning, Father, the way that you have spoken to us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for one another. We thank you for yourself, for Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who empowers us. We thank you for this church. We, we just give you thanks, Lord, that we are part of your kingdom. We are part of the answer, not part of the problem. And Lord, we believe that you are going to build us up. We want to pray for our church today. We pray for our, one another as individual uh, stones in this building. We pray that you will build every one of us up. Lord, that we might be a support to each other. We pray that you will give each one of us what we need to become strong in you. Make us disciples, Lord, of Jesus, who will be able to go and, and reach out into our community and help others to find the wonderful love and truth and grace and peace and joy that you pour out on us in your, in, through your uh, salvation that we have. And Lord, in this holy week, we just pray that you will meet with us individually and make us a witness to our town as we celebrate together these different events that will be happening this week. And Lord, especially your wonderful day of victory and resurrection. Thank you, Father, for all your gracious gifts to us. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.